Greetings everyone and welcome to the third episode of us playing as the state of Guangdong in which we are, uh, well, trying to get a lot of Sony here. But we gotta consult with the Japanese, which we currently read last time, but we got a little change in the factories. The cries of Chun's younger sister jolted him awake. The piercing pitch only somewhat muted by the dull pain that had squeezed his spine. The disturbance was by no means new to the Lee family, Chun especially, to who had endured much worse in his split ear and a bad back during the short life in the city. Chun took out the confusion. Not a minute could be spared to dwell on the complexities of his new life's arrangements. It was time to trudge to work, and he waved a tired goodbye to his mother, numb to the cries and the aching. Step after step, his hands buried deep in his pockets, he had already become a mindless chore to him. His bleak expectations were dispelled during a short lunch break. Word of action by the government spread. Some mentioned higher wages, others prophesied protection from the abuse, but these details mattered little to Chun. Merely the fact that the government was willing to consider any form of improvements was enough to raise his spirits as he returned to the factory floor. His optimism soon vanished again as he heard the owner's distant voice announce amidst open laughter. There's no way those darn fools can enforce this. I'd pay more attention to a dog than this darn bill. Later that night, Chun heaved himself dejectedly through the door of his family's apartment, only for Hay to nearly knock him over at the door, exclaiming that their father had the, mo the most money in hand since they'd come to Ko Koshu. His father had an announcement to the whole family, one that gave Chun some welcome relief after the trials of the day. I'll order us all pork for tomorrow. Cool. And you are cordially invited as we are still fighting in Malaya because, you know, we love Malaya. You, me, Malaya, what's not to love? Suzuki's desk is in, it, is in its usual condition, unorganized and crowded with paperwork. The chief executive continues to attend to his matters. Everyday mundane pen pushing, this time a document on the management of coal assets in Guangdong. As he continues to progress through the document, the secretary enters the office, placing another sheet of paper upon the pre-existing piles. Suzuki merely glances at it before asking the secretary what it's about. Tell me what this one's about, make it quick, said Suzuki, continuing his work. Well, it's certain to be a letter from the Empire Manchuria and an invitation of some sort, replied the secretary. This made Suzuki appear visibly intrigued, dropping his pen and picking up the letter. Why were the Manchurians inviting us to anything? Let them be with their supercilious attitudes and supposed grandeur. We're better off here anyway, though one we may be fine clients. He tore open the envelope, bearing the seal of Manchukuo, revealing invitation to its history. Thinking for an economic conference of all of China. Suzuki saw his golden opportunity to create connections, but it likely isn't going to happen anytime soon. The details could be settled later. He passed it back to the secretary, telling him to set it aside for some time in the future, and returned to his original task. Excuse me, Mr. Suzuki, are you aware that the date for the RSVP was around a month ago? Remarked the secretary in distressed tone. Suzuki merely put his work on hold and began frantically writing down possible candidates to accompany him to his king. Whoever it would be it would be a part of what represents Suzuki and the state of Guangdong as a whole to much of the co-prosperous here. Matsuzawa and Niosudo, Morita and Sony. We could carry favor with Matsushita. Ibuka and Fujitsu are the only people for the job. Well, of course, we're going to go with Sony, but parlay with the Manchurian hosts. The Empire of Manchuria are questionably our more, foremost rivals in the cold prosperity sphere, competing with our products and our merchants for the market share and influence with raw industrial might and slave labor. They look down at us. At every turn, the representatives of the Emperor are thumbing their noses down at our chief executive. But we ought to pay a visit to the host of the conference and show a show of pan Asian unity, no matter our mutual animosity, and who knows, maybe these arrogant Manchus might just be uh, something valuable slip, meaning the Japanese. Suzuki sat alone on the quiet side of the chamber, its atmosphere calm and silent against the thundering crowds of investors and delegates in the palatial halls, a stark contrast to the rest of the convention. He checked his watch once again, the ticking apparent in, his, in the silence. He wondered if his watch was broken, but it was unlikely, even 20 minutes after the scheduled time. A uh, faint, faint creak at the door was heard, heralding the arrival of several uh, uh, men in professionally tailored suits of much superior quality than Suzuki's own, the Japanese delegation. I apologize for retarding this, one of the men said. We have more important business to attend to. Uh, Suzuki begrudgingly nodded and continued down his planned topics to, as to mention as usual. The menace seemed indifferent to his proposals, but the conversation proceeded along smoothly. And thus, it would be greatly appreciated if extra investments in Guangdong were solicited, continued Suzuki. And the delegation began a shift, prompting one of the men in the group to speak. Chief Executive Suzuki, we would love to provide additional investments, but that must come some other time. We'll attempt to provide what we can for now, but the current focus is all upon Manchukuo. It's the reason why we're here, after all. The meeting had progressed another few minutes before the delegation had decided it was reasonable to leave. Suzuki remained in the room inside, feeling utterly dissatisfied. It could have gone worse, and approached the Chinese. While our northern neighbors have never been particularly satisfied with the loss of Guangdong, we do need to play nice with the Chinese. A phone call to Nanjing and a few ho hollow promises should be enough to get them to parlay with us. And some, with a population of several hundred million, and some rather ambitious modernization plans, China could be quite a bountiful market in our near future, and it wouldn't do to let this opportunity go amiss. So we're so divided here, but we still want to keep some political power as well. We're closed for now as our research is going on very, very nicely for Sony because we are bolstering them up, up as much as possible. Um, uh, I guess we can do that one. Also, our objectives here are done. So we really don't need to be here anymore. River crossings maybe uh, exceeding 25 degrees, even though it's January. Are we in the southern hemisphere though? Use rifles in jungle environment. Urban, what's the temperature here like? No idea. If we did this, 
Would that help our guys out at all? Just a little bit. Just a tiny bit. So we could end the text test product, but which equals finest. The marble halls adorned in gold statuary and vermilion carpeting, illuminated by electric chandeliers nestled gently in recesses of the cavern or ceiling. The finest delicacies, Chinese ducks or ch Japanese sea urchins, the Hsing could offer were served on silver platters by the soundless legion of Emperor Pu Yi's household staff. An audience of hundreds milled about, in morning gowns and evening dresses, summoned from across the corners of China and the sphere to be present in Manchukuo, the second eldest brother of the sphere. It was a bit, all a bit over, over a bit at the top, the chief executive Suzuki thought. It was clear that the organizers of the Pan-Asian Chinese Economic Conference had spared no expense, even if the marble scuffed in places and the electric lights faded in comp compared to the neon Akoshu, and the Chinese knew how to make a strong first impression. They, did, they, not the first regime in Nanjing, were the light and glory of China for now and forever. And, at the Nanjing delegation, having arrived in the best morning suits could in court attire, with what scant decorations of the Japanese allowed them on their chest, was being given short shrift, even Suzuki and Guangdong delegation being ignored entirely. Having scrambled onto a plane with just enough time to pack a set of clothes, Suzuki looked as though he would... Look on any other day in Koshu, donning a tailored, expert, expertly pressed brown suit with a tasteful pocket uh, chief. Or pocket chef. Pocket chief. He might have as well appeared as if he was begging on Hitsing streets. Let's go to talk to the guests. And also, we need to have our economic check soon. In less than two months, we need to have a GDP of 23.06 billion. 23.2 billion. We've done it. Yay. We barely got there. And uh, we'll approach the Chinese. And we have some comments to go through as well. Someone says, Jesus, I don't remember Guangdong being so massively dense. Oh yeah, the TNO devs have outworked, outworked themselves once again. They've done it. They do such a fantastic job with the mod. It's amazing. Um, will you learn anything? You can and will, but you know whatever. The mentoring hosts and then a gilded office aside from the convention, adorned with decor and symbols of the Emperor, Empire of Manchuria, sits Manchukuo's economic minister and chief executive Suzuki. Their eyes locked onto each other, a resentful tension emanating between the two men. The strange silence is broken by the minister now, Mr. Suzuki. How have you been enjoying the amenities of the Empire? There is no doubt you must be awed by the industrial power prowess of the sphere's crown jewel. Suzuki does not reply. I've heard about the burgeoning success of the Guang Guangdong electric industry. It might be a proof of problem for us later on, but for now it's merely a trifle, though we'll have to see, continued the minister. Suzuki is utterly baffled. Such an outlandishly impolite tone and choice of words. Problem? Trifle? Is that what he compares the state of Guangdong and its industry to? Suzuki exited the office after a couple minutes, barely having said but a handful of words. Clearly fuming about the outrageously discourteous attitude of the minister, the man that, like... Like that representing an entire nation's economy was unthinkable to him. He does leave glad with one thing, though. Guangdong, as far as he knows, was a considerable a threat to the Manchurians. And the mere mention of the electronics industry made Suzuki a lot more hardened with his nation. Not yet, but soon. Increases monthly computational power. For a small cost? I'm okay with that. I wonder how far we can take this, take this at all. Uh, it is 1963. Happy 63, everybody. Hope you're having a great year. We'll get some anti-air because we can, and then we will go on space in the sphere. After days of shuffling pa folders, collecting paperwork, and organizing scripts, the chief of executive is finally scheduled to deliver the, his address in the closing moments of the Tsing King, Tsing King Economic Conference. There he shall speak directly to representatives from across the co-prosperity sphere about the economic miracle beginning to emerge from the Pearl the River Delta. While Suzuki is not particularly pleased about receiving the final allocated slot in the lineup speakers for this conference, he'll use the time to the best of his abilities. The clock strikes early to the uh, morning hours, and people begin to leave, but Suzuki is here to tell the world that Guangdong is open for business, a monument to loyalty. Zane looked over the pagoda of the loyal spirits, and he could tell that it was built to look impressive. The stone monument towered not over, only over Zhang, but also on both sides of Port Shorty. With the sun behind it, the 80 meter tower blanketed the surrounding area in shadow. The previous night's rain cut the morning sunlight, granting the pagoda's co concrete a soft sheen. The tower stood above much of the city. Uh, from atop its mountain peak and massive stone foundation, in all aspects, it truly represented Japan's rule over Hong Kong. Zhang struggled to remember the details of its past beyond the basics. He knew it had been constructed during the war, although it only properly was finished several years after peace with America had been achieved. There was also apparently some ancient Japanese blade buried beneath the massive tower, an act signifying Japan's future victories in battle. And yet, despite all the grandeur and all the aspirations, the pagoda was little more than a hunk of concrete. When the Japanese had built it, it stood atop Hong Kong's skyline alone, unchallenged. Now skyscrapers died of the city skyline, and from a distance, the pagoda was either hardly visible or blended in among the many other geometric towers. The pagoda couldn't even claim to be unique, with dozens of similar monuments dotting a battered China's coast. Each monument was yet another drop of a blood so katana falling upon the canvas of time. Each drop destined to merely fade away with the passing years. The awe that the pagoda had momentarily inspired in Zhang had snuffed out, replaced instead by questions. Foremost among them were two. What made this monument special? And what makes Guangdong special? Now the Chinese ambassador. The opulent nature of the Manchukuo court has not been kept a secret to anyone attending the conference, especially not Chief Executive Suzuki uh, and his humbling entourage, but this focus of Suzuki's... Uh, uh, 
during the conference was not his appearance, but its attendees. Suzuki's attention turned first towards the Chinese delegation, a colossal potential investment market, although they might not be so keen, especially regarding Guangdong and China's tumultuous and uneasy past. He never really did talk to the men at Nanjing much, no more than a couple meager phone calls, despite the fact that China was right next door. As Suzuki approached the delegation, a face seemed instantly familiar. Song Ziguang, China's consul general to Guangdong. He had been born in what used to be the province of Guangdong, and was undoubtedly still quite peeved about his departure nonetheless, but... He was still a man to be, would be the man to approach for any, uh, any communications. Uh, Song spotted Suzuki approaching and immediately greeted him. Hello, Mr. Suzuki. I see you made it, said Song politely, with a bit a tinge of bitterness in his voice. <clears throat> well, Song, it pleases me to see you. Just be informed that Guangdong is always welcome to investments, and for the benefit of all of Asia, replied Suzuki. With a sentence. Oh, my bad. Oh, crap, I wanted the game to save and stuff went up. Um... We have investments, which is cool. Also, we have a couple of green tea here, too. But, with a sentence, or a feeling of unease emanating from Song, it took a second before responding. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. I'm sure we'll get to it at some point. After all, it's our duty to support a populace. Suzuki felt a tinge of animosity from the reply. Did he mean our, as in us, or as in them? Suzuki wrapped up the short conversation with a reassurance that they could come to him at any time. Are the hour still ling excuse me, lingering in his mind? A thinly veiled insult. Advancement in audio-video technology. Exciting news from the executives and engineers of Guangdong today, as great advancements in the audio-visual technology have been announced. This year's round of product launches include a full suite of new TVs, radios, cameras, and recording equipment that will be made available to the consumer market. Now more than ever before, consumers will be able to record their memories and moments most precious to them. The cinema and music industries will be able to reach heights never thought possible, and the miracle of innovation on the Pearl River continues. Does anyone know where the play, the play button is on this thing? Increase their initial minimum product interest. Nice. Increases prof profitability, profitability more. And decreases our month basic research by 10%. Oh, shnikes. The Chief Executive's presentation. Recollecting how much he had anticipated the upcoming moment, the Chief Executive felt deep despair as he looked out to the audience. It was a presentation of such importance to the future of Guangdong, yet no more than a handful of members from the Japanese delegation could be bothered to show their face. His notes, so painstakingly prepared a long time in advance, might as well have turned to dust there and then, for all good, this presentation would be due, due for investment in Guangdong. In spite of this, Suzuki was bluntly determined to persist. At the very least, this empty crowd might yet be swayed, more so he thought, until even this meager hope was dashed by a thunderous entrance of a runner bearing desperate news. A hushed, breathless message was delivered and silence filled the hall. Worried glances were exchanged, what remained of the Japanese cohort soon fell out, filed out amidst mutterings of the more urgent matters unfolding in, in Tokyo. Uh-oh. <clears throat> The crowd now virtually emptied, descended into a commotion over what had just taken place. As more and more left, uh, whatever interest that had been retained for the future prospects of Guangdong died, and Suzuki Tai Chi could only watch as a moment fell about him. So this was just, such was the fate of what was supposed to be the greatest achievement of the man's life so far. Not one to be broken by even the most unfortunate turns of the fate, the chief executive resolved by that, that by the time of the next conference, all eyes would be on Guangdong. All he needed was time, and fortunately he had just been handed a great deal of it. He ripped his cigarette out of its garden as he left, leaving in a little more than a puff of smoke. The work has only just begun. Outpacing and outrunning the great empire of Manchuria economically will show Guangdong to the sphere in the world. Enjoy, enjoy prospects. Amidst a cacophony of buzzing exhaust pipes and unintelligible shots that define the nature of the metropolis Hong Kong, resided an unremarkable property, indistinguishable from the vast ocean of buildings that surrounded it. An inconspicuous office was nestled within the mundane complex registered to Yamauchi, Hiroshi, and the Nintendo Corporation. Yamauchi had been, ever since he first stepped ashore, precariously. Uh, examining and evaluating the merits of certain consumer markets, he clasped his hands together tightly and smiled with a glee. It seemed that countless hours of exhausting evaluation and reevaluation finally bear fruit. He peered over the piles of external fiscal reports and documents on market trends that spread across his desk, his focus centered upon one. The instant food in industry it was a new source of demand that had only been pioneered within the last decade, an instant market abundant with potential for expansion and growth. Yamauchi once again considered the prospects for innovation. The instant noodle market had been dominated long ago by its creator. Momofuku Ando and his company of Nissan Foods. Entry would mean fierce and established competition which we, he could not hope to outmatch. Himauchi knew, however, that the possibilities of instant foods were not exclusively limited to noodles. His mind immediately pivoted to the staple food that sustained the livelihoods of tens of millions across Asia and the world, rice, a realm that Momofuku had failed to conquer. Akin to noodles, rice could be dehydrated easily and rehydrated with mere addition of heated water. Yet other corporate entities had not expanded extensively into this prospect, making it ripe for development and profit. Yamauchi hurriedly retrieved a sheet of paper and began sketching down rudimentary concept as it was time for scattered thoughts to manifest in reality. Sanguine hopes. Pacifying the river, uh, Pearl River Delta. Oh. With the conclusion of the conference in Manchuria, <coughs> our attention is diverted back to plans for stabilizing the nation. Suzuki has been hard at work in negotiating his thoughts around stability in the Pearl River Delta and finding a solution to remedy the surgence of agitators harassing local authorities. This proposed labor bill will be useful in settling unrest across the cities. And will help draw support for dissenters across populace. We will have to, tools to couple the two and begin identifying and cracking down on the dissenters themselves without punishing hardworking citizens going about their daily lives. Followed up by the cost of informants. 
Corruption increases by 3%. Jesus. Um, gangsters chasing gangsters. The daily hurdle in gathering intelligence for investigations is the public's lack of trust. Our citizens do not have faith in that the police or the Camp Bai Tai will treat them fairly as informants. The military brutal brutality of the Camp Bai Tai and their expensive jurisdiction fills the average citizen with an exhausting dread and when the authorities are at the door if you have faith that anything good will come in the interaction. Combined with the disorganized, impetuous state of our own police force, law enforcement in Guangdong has become more of a brawl between two street gangs. This must be changed if we want to see any improvements in confronting dissent in the future. Affordable living. A wooden sign stood unevenly against the wall, barely legible by the dim glow of a falling uh, lamppost. <clears throat> Sickly yellow text lay atop of the chipped red paint, listing a series of rooms for rent and their prices for single people and families alike, none bigger than 25 square meters. After a yip, Officer Yip looked at the rent and wondered if it would have been more expedient to just buy a shoebox instead, but he was not here for a lease. The landlord had clearly skimmed on the stairwell lighting, making his ascent slow and laborious. Yip made a note to jot down the housing code violation as soon as he was able to see his own notebook again. His footfalls sent hard echoes through the concrete, creating miniature jolts in his heart. He was forced to remind himself that he was not in uniform, nor he was attempting to hide himself, except in plain sight. The front door would do here, regardless of what the chief said. There was only one path to promotion in this town for someone with a name like his, and besides, he so had a pride as a brother. The stairwell gave way to a corridor and an increasingly pervasive smell of vinegar. Yep, so jostled his way past bicycles and left out trash bags, barely visible through the thin slivers of gold light coming from the apartments of the few still awake. <coughs> Excuse me. He inched closer and closer to his destination. He stopped in front of a, a number he sought. Here, all would be revealed. He brought his hand up to the knock to knock, just as any other hand from behind closed door began behind his neck. You're not on the guest list, sir. Uh, someone else says, from the, a comment says, What path are you going down? If you want to use the corporation's products, you have to go down their path. So, I know I put Sony in the title, and the original project, we did not do Sony, but we went back and we did do the Sony um, audio device. So, um, someone says, Glad you got my message to play Guangdong. Also, make sure that you choose focus and decisions that benefit Sony, like adding Legco seeds for them. Also, make sure to gain more Japan and China's support while cracking down on corruption to get to down to zero. Well, we'll try to. We'll definitely try to. Um, right now. Well, you know, Sony, let go members, yep. So we'll see. No ordinance right now, but I'm sure we'll have some soon. Progress. Nine, oh, a little more than nine a month, which is nice. Uh, oh, investigate, let go. That'd be good. Yeah, we want to keep doing this. Oh, but we need political power probably soon, too. Oh, uh, that's probably a bad idea. River crossings are not bad. And jungles. Rivers and cr jungles. Well, actually, that's not hard to do at all. I'll do that one. This would be it. There. Alright. The work remains. <coughs> it's been a long journey from it's it's a king back home for Suzuki. The ache of failure he felt in his chest hurt almost like as much as the weariness in his eyes. Not that either of those ailments matter, for the issues Guang Dong still needed to attending to. In the wake of the conference, the constant conflict of stabilizing the region seemed mundane. By the time Suzuki returned to his work, the towering monotony struck him again. In an attempt to perk up his system, he reached for the carton of cigarettes, however. He was to be disappointed. He must have torn through the lot during this trip. For a moment, he thought about calling for another to be brought up to his office, but soon decided against it. What was before him needed to be dealt with swiftly with his undivided attention. The issue of the day was the centers. To some extent, they had always been a problem, always causing what the majority of the executive council believed to be unnecessary internal strife. The difference now was that the powers that be now had the authority to directly quell all disobedience. All that remained was for Suzuki to order what dissenters remained in the wake of the passing of the Revised Labor Standards Ordinance to be identified and arrested. After signing this off, without a moment's hesitation, Suzuki sent down his pen and instinctively reached for a cigarette. The carton remained empty, much to his own disappointment. He struggled on, ignoring how his own urges, knowing it was going to be a long day regardless of how much he smoked. This is his usual and the language barrier. And such a nation that is Guangdong, there exists a very simple problem that plagues every level of intelligence administration. The chatter in darkened uh, street corners, damp evening markets, and the rustling uh, bus shelters is conducted in Cantonese, a language still un unintelligible to most Japanese, of course. We lose valuable time transiting, confusing ourselves with cases, tenses, and characters, all costing us valuable time and resources, until we address this gap within the both camp by time and the circles of trusted officers in the police force. We'll never be able to tell dissidents apart from the average citizen, which is a big old problem. Working on it still. Not a day late, not a dollar short. As you can see, gentlemen, with the productivity increasing and wages being kept static, Guangdong's gross domestic product has increased twofold since fiscal year 1962. We expect to see profits rising in the next fiscal year alongside new investments and greater productivity efficiency from better R&D. Suzuki looked out into the room of auto men in business suits, listening in on his presentation. 
With the fluorescent bulbs above them gave their nods of approval of Gaspier's quality, he could feel their projection seep into his eyes as they drew graphs of various lines and arrows on the wall behind him. The shareholders did not quite care for Suzuki, and Suzuki did not quite care for them, but he knew that they were the real commanders of the rural Pearl River Delta. The fact that what he had to say and show was making them happy would mean that Guangdong could go forward. And with the 1963 dawning upon us, I expect Guangdong to remain a shining example of economic success in the Great East Asia Cold Prosperity Sphere. The suits took in the information for a moment before giving Suzuki a standing ovation, a miracle on the Pearl River. So increases a Japanese expat sport, Zujin sport, increases Japan's approval by 5%. Our shareholders expect a real growth, growth of 9%, or GDP of 25.5 billion. Well, we might actually be able to get there. 9% is not bad, but... Duckyard Rumble. Scanning the shores of Hong Kong, an officer awaited the arrival of another group of smugglers. Such missions have become customary for the more experienced officers of the Guangdong police. The leader of the particular operation was anything but a seasoned veteran of the streets of the city. Officer Ar Ari Hara Goro had only just arrived from his training in Japan, and from what he could tell, he was about to be thrown into the thick of it. Slowly, an approaching shimmer in his binoculars gave away his target. Seeing some of his men get agitated, he hissed at them to back down. Ari Hara uh, Goro was not about to let these criminals get away. He paused for a moment longer, letting his prey walk further into the trap. A barrage of barked orders shattered the stillness of the evening air. Goro's men stepped forward from their position, startling the smugglers. The officer did his best to keep his cool as he went in to apprehend the men. Halt all of you. You're under arrest. Do not attempt to resist. As the words were soon lost. One of those men, in his confusion, had drawn a pistol and began aimlessly pointing it at the smugglers. A strange fear gripped both parties. Goro found himself unable to retain or gain control of the situation. He looked on in horror as a brawl erupted around him. A crescendo of shouts and screams swelled from the streets. Passerbys scattered in every direction, trying to skip the desperate smugglers who were now charging next to the police cordon. Officer Goro gripped his baton, though his mind held on to little more than a prayer that he would not be the next victim of Guangdong's criminal scourge. There was little else to do, or else he could do. Good. The cost of informants. To date, gathering intelligence on dissident activities has relied on a network of informants freckled upon the Delta. This web of respondents is maintained by the Kenpai Tai, whose units keep a close eye on the crime lines of Guangdong, backed by our local police forces. The network is a tool often used in cracking down on the growing dissent activity across the nation. However, we are confronted with an opportunity to break the ranks of the insurgents before they grow too large, saving ourselves the risk of anarchy in the streets. We must consider the cost of investing in an intelligence network, backed by the state resources, to vastly increase our capability to detect subversives. <coughs> Excuse me. They're going in, so it uh, might help us out too, maybe. Fighting over river does? No? Jungle and. Yeah, no river. Um, I guess you're probably not in the battle. That's probably what's up. But this tea is pretty good. Green tea matcha. Matcha green tea. Pretty darn decent, I would have to say. You know what? You don't, you don't get anything for that. Just wait. They're attacking us, which is fine. Oh, so close. Learning curves. Lamb winced as he heard the officer speak, his Cantonese barely decipherable between the poor pronunciation and the smattering of Japanese. A look of confusion plastered on the face of the man opposite of him, of course. <clears throat> the officer repeated his question twice over, further butchering the language with each successive attempt. It was on the man's third try when Lamb stepped in. Repeating the question, and this time the man responded with narrowed eyes and no emotion in his voice. No, officer, I can't say I've seen anything worth reporting, nor have I seen anything, anyone here who matches your description. Will that be all? Lamb nodded and moved on, taking careful note of the contemptuous glances being shot his way, both from the officers and the resident. Lamb Hao Xion shrugged it all off. They didn't have to like him, but they'd have to learn Cantonese. Progress and Project Panopticon had been made clear to the administration that traditional methods of maintaining public order will not suffice in Guangdong. Too many slip under the radar to get away with all and get away with all kinds of filthy acts and desperate crimes. The continuation of Japanese dominion over southern China requires new thinking and new solutions. Our great inculcator is technology. An ear in every conversation, an eye in every room. And with the use of technology, we can try to make our new surveillance state as, as can be as invisible as possible, removing the human elements entirely. <clears throat> All of it will cost us time and money, so we must hasten to make our proposal convincing enough to Tokyo. And we'll get to the next level. Nice. Nice. We're very close. Ah, uh, we're done here, basically. Through service, the custom station's nearly unblemished concrete construction and bow, unbowed by rain and time. Uh, sit in stark contrast to the aging frames of the rolling stock dock. Uh, creating a precariously on half rotting railroad ties. Uh, the border checkpoint between the Republic of China and the state of Guangdong was the most visible symbol of the artificial divide in the Chinese mainland, an unnecessary addition to the nearly three decade old Koshu Hankou Railway. A Chinese soldier, uh, Liu, uh, emerged from the passenger car on the latest Koshu Bound Express, calling over his Guangdong counterpart with a wary nod Your turn, Chung. No discrepancies in the passports and other documents, said Chong, wearing the uniform of the Guangdong police force. If there were, I'd have pulled him over for questioning. Liu handed over a clipboard, a manifest with the passengers on board. Mm hmm. Chong looked over the manifest twice before handing it back to the soldier. Nobody looking or acting suspicious? Nothing unusual, Liu said before flashing a cynical smile, though, given you call yourself Zhu Jin instead of Chinese these days, I guess it doesn't look, I guess looks don't count for much. 
Whatever you say. Chung rolls her eyes while clambering into the passenger car to conduct his inspection. All around Leo and Chung, two chefs of station staff, customs agents, and border police milled about. Their differences apparent only in the two sets of uniforms they wore. If one closed their eyes, I could be forgiven for thinking there was no difference at all. One train, but two lines. More than pocket money. Deep in the heart of the labyrinthine streets, uh, where the light struggles to reach past the blackened rooftops, a squad of uniformed men gathered. They assembled quietly, surrounded by the normal bustle of the day, at the base of the one particular block, then awaited their next place, uh, next command. The officer checked a no, and once certain that this was the place he ordered his men for, what came next did not last long, but nevertheless caused quite a stir, of course. All sorts of noises emerged from the midst of commotion that ensued. The barking orders of the police cut across the confused yelps and pleas of the locals inside. A torrent of crashing followed as some panicked and attempted to escape the apartment. Despite these startled efforts, they were all soon caught. One by one, they were handcuffed and led out under the streets where our truck awaited to take them to the police station. Not a word was said of the crows that had gathered, but the message was clear. The centers would be found and dealt with no matter where they hid. Just as the clamor of the crowd had peaked, the elating officer had entered an adjacent building. Awaiting his arrival was a man readily greeting him as he entered. All the money he had promised was handed over, and the camp fight type paid as well as they had heard. He had been lucky to have been such has had to have such a rebellious neighbors. Efficient surveillance has its costs, and one of a kind. <coughs> it appears the batteries and radios aren't the only thing our engineers are talented at building. Against all expectations, the product testing research group's weapon has blown away the competition. Our design harnesses uh, both the technical scale and complexity to Guangdong's engineers and the ruggedness and reliability that the PTRG's testers have demanded from their weapons. Our design is a talk of every single IJA and IJN officer across the empire, from the jungles of Burma to the icy winter steppes of Manchukuo. There's only one question on the lips. How do I get such a delightful tool of war and bloodshed to my men as soon as possible? Like the rest, they'll have to wait for a prize contract with the government to have its the eyes dotted and the T's crossed before they use it on guerrillas and villages they, uh, they, that need a reminder of the liberation under the Pan-Asian dream for Kuang Dong. The contract promises further riches beyond our wildest expectations, while arming our forces with weapons that Washington and Germania didn't even think was possible for this decade. Even if we lose this competition, no general will ever pass on our design entirely, and a place where our rifles and a niche role in the military is almost certainly guaranteed. We have no remorse for the blood on our hands, given the thickness of our wallets. <laughs> Absolutely. If someone complains, I'm sure we can offer them a discount or a field demonstration. God, it'd be nice to have money. God, I hate being poor. Give ourselves a pat on the back. Due to fulfilling five combat missions, we gain the following effects. Ooh, increase the Sony's Lego seats by two. Increase liquid reserves by 0.22 billion. A national spirit named PTRG profits will be obtained with the following effects. More real growth, 4% real growth, 5% GDP growth. China's and Japan's opinion improves by 4%. We can do so much better. Oh, where compromise do not exist. We'll receive the results of this further effort in 30 days. Increases the seats by three. We get less opinion, you get more actual growth. You get three seats, you get 0.3 billion. Um, huh. Honestly, I'd rather get this one. We can do so much better. Just because we get we get more money, we get more of everything, so. That's awesome. I love it. I'm gonna come down here and help them out too, but eh, we'll see. We'll see what this one does too. Also, so now, I bet you we'll have more seats here. Yay! That's what we want. That's absolutely what we want. Um, and we want correct on petty corruption. That'd be good to do. Actually, do we change anything here yet? No. I do want to get rid of them because we're really close. We're very close here. I don't want to spend any more political power though. I don't want to decrease Chinese government support though either. I don't mind doing this one. I don't want to just cost political power. Political power is such a very precious thing to keep. Um, 15. Let's go down but quite a bit more. The solution. As he read through yet another disappointing report, Guangdong's chief executive idly wondered on the point of the failure of the latest operation. Every week it would seem like he would get another report on the failings or setbacks of Guangdong's security forces. Failing prey to bribery, mishandled information, or some other reversal in the struggling root out Guangdong's troublemakers and gangsters. As Suzuki's eyes poured over the latest setback, he inwardly sighed. It seemed like none of the initial plans were turning out how he hoped. A pity. Putting aside the report and reaching for a cigarette, Suzuki's eyes wandered over a discarded document, a public review of some proposals from France. While the pros proposer, some French philosopher, hardly seemed of any note. His proposal is quite the opposite. A pantopicon, a system with an all-seeing warden, might have seen outlandish at first glance, but as the review was happy to note, it did possess some promise, especially the latest developments coming from Guangdong's burgeoning electronics industry were to be believed. Now that got Suzuki thinking. While Guangdong did not have the manpower professionals to create a well-connected intelligence network or an effective counterintelligence agency, it may just have the technology route to send. Placed in the folder side, Guangdong's chief executive began making some phone calls. This full call. A uh, guy might just fell, might just be onto something, uh, something. Yeah, he might be onto something. Full call. I probably pronounced that wrong. So, now what? Your plus not very much. More growth is nice. Inflation's almost nothing. I love, uh, I love corporate ol oligopoly. Honestly, no, I don't like it. God, welcome to America. I mean China. 
Alright. Oh, blue water navy. We'll probably want a green water navy. Honestly. I don't see the point of anything else. Uh. Well, that's not good. Out oh, with a crash. Shh. Nikes. 88%. That's very good. Hey, 43% is pretty good, too. Tempen G. Uh, Chief Executive Suzuki Taichi could barely rest himself away from the radio, leaving a pile of paper growing unattended. The names are being read out loud. Ikeda, Fujiyama, Inu Inukai. Anyone who was anybody in Tokyo politics was being accused. Prime Minister Ino would surely be implica implicated in hours. Oh, shnikes. Suzuki's mind raised. There had to be a call he could make to salvage the situation. Even his contracts were named only one by one by an emotional nucleus caster. Frantically, when he dialed Matsuzawa's office number and waited, with every second his fears multiplied. Matsuzawa was speaking. His voice could barely be heard above the... Was it shouting? Screaming? D despondency? Suzuki, this is a bad time. What the heck is going on, Suzuki? Wasting no time. Is it Minazaka? Yes. Matsuzawa's response was blunt and unequivocal. Between the bribes, uncolored, uncollateralized exposure, the fraud, Yasuda will sink under the weight of it all, and I don't see anyone in Tokyo coming to, to our rescue. Suzuki felt the world away... Uh, sway beneath his feet, forcing him to sit to steady himself. Yasuda was dying. Japan was in chaos. Overnight, everything had changed, and Guangdong would be swept away like a twig in a storm. I have to see whatever's left of Yasuda, Matsuzawa said tersely. You should return to your work. Try not to look at the stock market. It had fallen by 20%, racing towards zero. Oh, shnikes. Instead of Guangdong, it evolves to the Yasuda crisis. Our approach of policing will evolve into blunt force policing. Oh, shnikes. So their approval actually went down. They still, they still like us. Corruption is still actually really high. Um, I gotta keep suppressing corruption. The music stops. Oh crap! What is all this? The only thing about the curtain. Yasuda, one of the cornerstones of the Japanese economy has collapsed and the sphere's economy has been plunged into out of chaos. Orders are drying up, customers are hunkering down, and companies are racing to confirm whether they have enough cash to survive Yasuda's collapse. And in Guangdong, Yasuda's position as a, one of the four companies means the world worth is surely in store unless we take action now. Everyone state, a decrease camp I take control. Increase Yazuka, Yakuza, and Triad. Increase levels of corruption 5%. Oh, shh, Nikes. Oh my god. Oh my god. Japan still likes us, though. Holy crap, we're already 18%. That's really good. Oh my. Oh. We get even more. Oh, are you kidding me? I don't want more corruption. Actually, 18, 28, 33. Uh, we, we can increase this one back if we do that really quickly, but whatever. Uh, demand answers from Tokyo. Mm, more growth. If we're scared, the investors might make up the bulk of investment in Guangdong are absolutely petrified. The investors that do that. Ever since the fateful day when the Yasuda stock price collapsed in Tokyo, Guangdong's market had been in freefall and the banks and investment houses in Hong Kong and Coast Yu are frozen in place. We need to get ahead of the news and reassure investors and companies that we'll have a situation under control shortly. Otherwise, the rumors of capital flights swirling through Guangdong could become reality, and that would surely be the kiss of death. Demand answers from Tokyo. Shout and anger. There's no shortage of answers we need from Tokyo in response to the Yasuda's collapse. Why weren't we informed, given the central position Yasuda, Yasuda occupies in Guangdong? What is the status of talks? If any, demands Yasuda's existing obligations. Have Japanese authorities extended any guarantees to Yasuda's creditors? Most importantly, will Japan's budget support for Guangdong's continue? Will the Japan support for us continue? Sell, 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 sell. How do you explain the loss of share prices over the past month, Chief Executive? Flash. The shouted question from the Canton Kaizai Shimbun reporter was accompanied by the brilliance of the magnesium flashball, blinding Suzuki as he faced down Guangdong's investors, reporters, and corporate executives in a repurposed hotel ballroom. Chief Executive, will Yasuda's local shareholders be repaid in full? A suited executive asked, his tone pleading. We're still waiting for talks to conclude in Tokyo, Suzuki articulated. Try not to blink amidst the barrage of camera flashes, but I can assure you that the Guangdong Civil Authority will ensure adequate liquidity for regular market activities. Does that mean the government will commit to backing the financial system? The flashes reached a fever pitch as reporters pressed his question, barely audible over the audience's uh, clamor. Even though the government cash reserves are nearly depleted, Suzuki fought to keep his expression neutral, his own unease boiling over in his stomach. There was no good answer. He could, be spent, he could spend and be darned by the corporates or be held back and be abandoned by the investors. We have sufficient reserves to back the currency and stabilize markets, Suzuki said, staring the reporter down. And as the government works to maintain, maintain stability, we ask for cooperation, cooperation in this trying time. Suzuki assaulted stock trading later that day. Oh boy, revisit the budget. Of the revenue that Guangdong's government collects organically, that is, without reliance on the customs levied or the financial contributions from Tokyo, much of it comes from the taxes paid by the companies operating in the territory. The tax rates are low to begin with in order to keep Guangdong favorably positioned against the rest of the sphere, but Japan's continued economic growth and the corresponding good performance of Guangdong's companies meant that we can expect fiscal stability. But if you see uh, financial troubles and impending collapse are as inevitable as recent news suggests, then our budget will have to be revisited urgently. Where company compromise do not exist. Ooh! Many doubted that our humble exp enterprise would be capable of producing a weapon fit to serve the needs of the 60s and beyond, began the spokesman. Either suppressing a grin or doing his best to appear to, to be. Mad eccentrics, they called us. Scheming jackals, incapable of putting aside our differences for the sake of Japan and the sake of innovation. He moved towards the tarp. How wrong they were.
Yet the cloth was whipped away to reveal a very odd-shaped machine. It's currently had something resembling a barrel and a trigger, though one complemented by so many attachments, snobs, and protrusions that one could be take mistaken for assuming the brain was making assumptions solely on context. However, a projector was soon fired into life, showing that the chimeric machine was indeed, indeed capable of throwing lead. The Japanese or Chinese kind reflected should you prefer grenades in the day or night vision, whatever the customer desired and whatever the foe dreaded. The spokesman continued to list off specifications when one of the IJA staff members in the back interrupted. Very impressive, but I have concerns for its use in sustained campaigns. We can't take it into the shop in the middle of the jungle. The spokesman agreed to not falter. Our ethos is to move fast and break things. If we do the same, there will be no issue. So, we get uh, a little more opinion from them. So, before we click on that, what's the maximum opinion we can have from China right now? So, we have opinion is 43%. Okay, so opinion oh, is capped at 48 so we're okay. And 88%, capped at 100%. That's good. That's fine. Beautiful. Even higher now. Awesome. 43% <coughs> uh, is not good at all, but it'll be lowered soon. We can do that too. And 45%, which is good too. So now, at Demand National Tokyo, we have 14 seats. Not bad. Very, very good. Could be better though. Uh, fiscal cliff. Our findings are bleak, the conclusions unavoidable. With the funds from Tokyo drying up, our budget bleeding red ink, and investors running for the exits, we have faced a financial apocalypse that makes it impossible to sustain our current levels of spending. Drastic action will be required. Spend money, increase more growth. Screw it, I'm going to pay out this, whatever debt we have right now. We're walking on air. It had taken all evening to find anyone at the Ministry of Finance in Tokyo to take Suzuki's call, even as the urgent missives and demands for action in Guangdong piled up on Suzuki's desk. What do you mean you can't provide any details on the budget? Suzuki roared into the phone. You know darn well there's only one reason I'm calling. With all due respect, given the current conditions of the present confusion, all discussions on the, about the budget are currently on hold. The bureaucrat's voice was haggard and fatigued. Please wait until the cabinet. The only thing that the cabinet is discussing right now is who gets sent to Sugano, Sugamo prison first. Suzuki pinched the nose of his bridge. Or the bridge's nose. The Prime Minister and I agreed that the budget support for Guangdong would be renewed. Is that still on the books? A silence followed by the crackle static. Chief Executive Suzuki. This is Director General Tani Moda of the Budget Bureau. I'm afraid we cannot commit to any new spending unless the cabinet redirects us to... Fine, Suzuki restrained the urge to, uh, to yell again as a foam. Will continue, continuing spending be authorized? Japan has its commitments to the co-prosperity sphere. Surely measures are in place. I cannot commit to anything, Chief Executive. The senior bureaucrat's voice was frigid. Any further details will follow from the Tokyo. That'll be all. The line went dead. Oh, crap. So, what do we do here now? Fiscal cliff. The tsunami of Chinese anger. Act economic recovery plan for Guangdong together with the tycoons. The devil makes work for idle hands, it's said. The greatest danger facing Guangdong comes from the Chinese, and we must ensure that they remain occupied with certain sweeteners if needed. Guaranteed deposits. Poverty will decrease by 1%. Sap excessive overtime. We decrease Suzuki's legacies by 1. Daytime work only. Lean on the landlords. Anything for security. Interesting. We will do anything to reassure the Chinese that they do not need to take up arms against them. Government save Zhujin suppliers. There is in the future of the economic model a skilled workforce with an income to power the consumer economy. They must be allowed to go under. Oh crap, I don't know which one we want to do. Freeze civil service cuts. We're going to really cut his uh, power. Increase his corruption. Guarantee civil service pay. Indemnity Japanese investors. The Japanese underwrite our entire operation in Guangdong and losing their support would be catastrophic. C catastrophic. Increases our seats, but as well as Yasuda seats as well, which I don't want. Extra security. Denied devaluation. Increases Japan's approval. Inflation increased by a lot. Decreases China's appro approval. Incru oh, you get. Oh, wow. You get a lot more growth. You lose inflation. When increases liquid reserves. Increases Suzuki's logo seats by three. There's a tsunami of Chinese anger, though. Probably decreased by 1%, lean on the landlords. Increases Chinese support and Japanese expat government support. Stop exp extensive overtime. We could really use more Chinese support, really. I don't know. Anything for security. Increase growth by 0.1%. Or this guy these guys. We lose two seats here. Oh, man, I don't know. Increase it by 0.25%. Increase the corruption. I think we might go with the tsunami of Chinese anger. I don't know. Sony seems like the Akio seems like the most reformist, so we're probably gonna go with the tsunami of Chinese anger. 
The consequence of the Yusuke Crest have borne more deadly fruit for Guangdong. With the sphere's economy shambles, the hordes of Cantonese workers are fuming at the loss of their jobs, along with the claims of corruption within our government. Our police in Kempai Tire are doing what they can to suppress the former sweatshop workers, but the influx of job hunters from across the sphere are starting to swell, further exasperating the protests. The laborers are demanding luxuries like paycheck bonuses, as well as food. It's rather expensive demand, especially during an economic crisis and one of our investors got gap. However, we don't do something to take care of the needs of our labor pool, we might have a revolt in our hands, and revolts don't blow wool for business. A beer credit in sinking. The only thing that made a day of bad news tolerable was reading about the misfortunes of someone else. Ha, <laughs> so true. Suzuki Tai Chi's eyes stopped at the front page of the Canton Kaizai Shimbun, which had put aside its regular coverage of the business beat in favor of politics. Prime Minister Ruan Zinduo of Manchukuo had finally been put out of his misery after presiding over the fall of both the Pan Asian Economic Conference and the Yusuda Crisis to be replaced by Gu Siheng, a high ranking functionary in the ruling Concordia Association. There had been no dignity in Ruan's fall from power, with his summary dismissal from office reflecting the depths of the crisis gripping Manchukuo, and the state had decided it was time for a firmer hand. The various factions surrounding the Manchurian throne, the Imperial Court, the Kwangtung Army, and the bureaucrats of the General State Affairs Bureau had elevated the technocrats and the Concordia Association to take Manchukuo forward. Suzuki Taichi doubted much would change, even though the new prime minister was ambitious and capable. So too were the rest of the power brokers in Sinking. All pulling of the fraying seams of Manchukuo's economy under the tired gaze of an aging emperor, a relic of a bygone age. Suzuki Taichi's didn't envy Gu. Life in Guangdong was similar, simpler, without imperial regalia, ideological trappings, or court grandeur, even if its politics were no less cutthroat. Here, the profit motive was, more, was what mattered most. And red ink. <clears throat> Suzuki. Oh, we need some of the tycoons first. Uh, had pulled out his dog-eared copy of the 1963 budget out on his desk was running the numbers, stabbing at the paper repeatedly as he revised the revenue and expenditure for projections with his fountain pen. Uh, <clears throat> he felt his hair standing on an end as every calculation, every estimate, pointed as a single terrifying conclusion. Guangdong was deeply in the red, draining its cash reserves just to stay afloat. The negative figure on the last page of the budget estimate stared angrily back at Suzuki. Uh, <clears throat> it's a vivid red demanding to be seen amongst all the black elsewhere on the page, and Suzuki could do little else but stare back gobsmack. How did it come to this? Well, it was a rhetorical question between Yasuda's collapse and Suzuki's own largesse in trying to pass the Labor Standards Ordinance. Suzuki knew full well that he shouldered a fair share of the blame for the Guangdong's crisis. It was a question asked as Suzuki's mind ground to a halt for the first time in years, fixated on why, asking why, and refusing to accept the obvious conclusions. It also kept the next question conveniently at bay. What comes next? How did Suzuki even begin to write the ship of state? Before Guangdong's investors began to run for the hills, if they hadn't already started to do so. The floor is falling out from underneath us, and some of the tycoons. We need to fill the gaping hole in our budget, and with the stark reality is that Guangdong has fewer resources of revenue aside from those corporations. The Chinese are too poor to tax, the Cantonese and Japanese fill critical positions in the government and in small business, and the Japanese expatriates would never open their wallets willingly. Chief Executive Suzuki had come to the conclusion that we must call upon the largest companies, those sitting on the Legislative Council, and the tycoons would do their part for the greater good. We we'll have to agree their ability to continue operating Guangdong for Guangdong to exist at all depends on it, quite literally, to hold the beggar's bowl. The Koshu skyline stretched out from the uh, midnight horizon. A constellation of glittering lights and glowing neon, interrupted only by the black depths of the Pearl River coursing through the heart of the city in these hours, Chief Executive. Suzuki's office was just one flickering light on the sea of thousands adrift in the night. Oh, look at that. We got back here too. Nice. Very good. That's hopefully less corruption. Uh, privately, Suzuki was grateful. The darkness swallowed the side of the new... Newly destitute and the shutter shops, the accidents that threatened to swallow Guangdong whole, Guangdong's failings, his failings, were hidden from him during the merciful night, and where he could escape the rage and recriminations that consumed his waking hours, even as financial reckoning loomed. There was no good options left. Suzuki thought plainly, uh, plaintively. Tokyo was silent. The Legislative Council fumed one day and cried out for relief the next, even though Suzuki had lined their pockets only a few months earlier. The Chinese were too poor to tax, the Zhujian were only going to ground, and the Japanese were circling the wagons. Suzuki felt his teeth grind together as he crushed the empty cigarette carton in his hand. It would come down to the four companies, as it always did. But now he would be helpless before them, stripped of any leverage by Yasuda's collapse. The tycoons were not known to be magnanimous, certainly not after being browbeaten by Suzuki himself for so long. But there was always self-interest, that guiding principle of capitalism. What was one more contribution in the face of imminent anarchy? I'm once again asking for your financial support. To hold nothing, Suzuki felt air around the tycoon's chill as he finished his proposal. Morita, Ibuka, and Matsushita. Matsuzawa was not present, to nobody's surprise, exchanged glances even as Suzuki stared at each of them in turn. It's ridiculous, Ibuka said irritably, lifting himself out of his seat. Suzuki blinked. We're not done, sit down. Enough, Ibuka exclaimed, rounding on the uh, chief executive. All the time you yelled us from up high to do this, do that. Now you want us to do you a favor, without even the courtesy to offer to make it up to us? We're in a crisis, and do you want to talk about courtesy? Suzuki sputtered. Do you think that we can survive alone? It's better than following you, Ibuka spat as he stormed out. I will be blunt. I do not trust you. If you want my help, give me something worth my time. The door slammed shut. Matsushita fixed his tie with a sense of a serene expression. His tone insincere. My brother will need some time to study this. I apologize, but for something this important, I cannot give you an answer immediately. Slam. Suzuki turned to Morita, who shrugged. 
If you book on a Mushi Matsushita or a pose, and if Matsuzawa is indisposed, I don't think my opinion will change anything. This is good business for them, I'm sure. Business, this is politics. Well, we'll see what we do next. To be nothing. Suzuki's foul mood followed the disastrous meeting of the four companies had hardly dissipated from, by the following morning, leading him to glare venomously at an approaching side or aide as he trundled into his office. What now? Suzuki nearly snarled, taking the offered copy of the Canton Sai Zai Shimbun out of the eight hands. What did the four companies want? The aide recoiled at the chief executive's prickly demeanor before composing themselves and pointing at the newspaper. They want your head, chief executive. What do you mean they? Suzuki opened the front page of the broadsheet and promptly fell silent. Chief executive's days numbered. Legislative council to petition for Tokyo for emergency recalling, citing no confidence. Suzuki didn't read much past the first few lines before he crumpled the newspaper in a fury, hurling it at the walls as the aide darted out of the room. This isn't politics, this is war. Introduced a conference motion on Chief Executive Suzuki to Legislative Council. Or so let's start with the following support. A lot of Suzuki has a lot of support. We need 12 seats. Crap. Oh, we don't even get the other tree. Oh, that's weird. Okay. Stop the presses. Increase patrols. Decrease Chinese government support. But get more police support. I like that. Decrease the, uh, government support. Demand you suit his loyalty when persuasion fails. A rebuttal. Increases corruption. Well, demand loyalty. The Yasuda Zaibatsu and his involvement in the corruption within the government is what started this whole mess. Matsuzawa Takuji was the head of the Hong Kong branch of Yasuda Bank, the main financial operative of the Zaibatsu. Matsuzawa's situation within Guangdong is one of importance since he represents one of the largest financial investors. While well, Matsuzawa has plenty to worry about and deal with, we need to make sure that he and his company will not abandon Guangdong. Shh, Nikes. When persuasion fails. Most of the investors in the Zaibatsus are willing to cooperate with us, and we thank them for their contribution, however. There are some investors who plan to abandon our industry, and their withdrawal from our economy will have deep repercussions on Guangdong. As the utmost importance that no company tries to leave our industry, unless they take us down with them, luckily. Most of these investors are heavily corrupt, and it won't take long to dig up a dirt on them. We could also use our new Yakuza friends persuading the investors, some call these methods exhortation, we call them survival, on the same boat. Another day and the barely tolerable work had come to an end, and Li Chun felt all the worse for it. The physical strain on repeatedly coming to work after day after day seemed uh, uh, on his body would, would one day heal, but the stress it inflicted on his mind may never be alleviated. His wages what got him through the day and that and the need to help support his family. The internal trouble he and his parents faced were so constant that it often felt like monitoring the greater strife of the outside world would only cause excessive anxiety. Yet the stress from the chaos of Yasuda's collapse had been unavoidable. It was too large a threat to their jobs to block out, but, and a, but a part of each of them was still detached from the possibility of anything serious happening. Chun could not bring himself to tell his parents the news once he got back, and he went to bed knowing that breaking the news was inevitable, and that, despite his best wishes, the guilt remained the next morning. He took the courtesy of waiting until his younger siblings had left to go to school. Had left to go to school. The accusations that the adults had had an easy bit at his patience. Working life was anything but, but that was something they never taught him in the classroom. Once they had left, the weight on his mind became too much to bear. He let them know, as best he could. The last thing he wanted to do was multiply the fear through the way he delivered the news, yet the words all too often failed to materialize as he would have liked them too. I cannot mask the truth. Cutbacks become a necessity. Life was about to become a lot more difficult until the job situation improved. The burden shifts from the body to the mind, on, on the same boat. Chief Executive Suzuki squirmed down his chair, beads of sweat forming and now flowing down his cheeks as he stared at the telephone resting on his cluttered desk with anxiety. He considered his position the chance that he would remain Chief Executive if he did not have a certain individual support. The decision had taken much deliberation. He hastily picked up the telephone, punching in the desired numbers. On the receiving end of the phone was the distant voice of Matsuzawa Taku Takuji, distressed and tired as usual, well-mannered tone having lost dissipated, long dissipated. Why are you calling me? Can't you tell I've worked to, to have to do and a career salvage? I need the support of you and what remains of a suit up in the coming vote of confidence in the Legislative Council. Suzuki spoke, running over Matsuzawa's uh, words of protest. It is imperative for me and you that I remain in my position. Our livelihoods are here depend on each other. We both have everything to lose. Look out the window, Suzuki. I've already lost everything, Matsuzawa interjected, following a sign of despair. The calm disarmed Suzuki, but he nonetheless continued. I know your troubles. I know of them. They must have made, made a severe debt upon your personal life. Look, I can't guarantee you much, but I can guarantee you this. Support me, and I will sustain you with a satisfactory position once we weather the storm together. Matsuzawa considered Suzuki's words for a short moment, before replying indefinitely, I'll see what I can do. 2 out of 22 is very good. 100%. So, no amendments. Currently have 22. So, we have 58 seats already. So, passing this gives following effects. Allows our esteemed chief executive to continue steering Guangdong from the fallout of the Suda crisis. We're good! So, now what? We're good! Increase patrols. Increases support. Oh god. 
<clears throat> the streets and the halls of the government are two sides of the same coin, they say. One side plunges into hellfire and the other one's bound to follow. Discontent from all sectors of civilian life is boiling over right now as we're busy trying, busy handling the chaos of ravaging our legislative council. And this cannot be allowed to stand. To this end, we shall intensely, uh, deploy, intensify deployment of our dutiful officers to the streets, even the camp by time if necessary, and keep a watchful eye on the signs of civil unrest. There'll be no room left for the cries of the Chinese, the protests of underpayment of the Zhujin, or even the concerning chatters of the Japanese for the sake of Guangdong's stability in the future. No measure is too extreme as we prepare for the next product to be released. Oh god. And literally like a week. A hard blaze. Cold sweat trickled down Suzuki's hand. Uh, blurring patch after patch of red ink on the paper. It had been days since he had been thrown into the red fight, flight or fight of his political life. Eating at his sanity as he wondered if he could truly trust any of the projections given to him. Even if those maggots of Yasuda somehow had common sense for once and un unanimously threw themselves behind his back. Barely suppressing the urge of a frustrated scream, Suzuki slammed the pen back onto the desk before turning his gaze to the already opened drawer, filled to the rim as ever with red envelopes. The past few months have been so absurd and hectic that the passing of the RLSO almost felt like a long time, lifetime ago. Yet all the bargaining, all the politicking, and all the briberies for its sake remain freshly etched in the Suzuki's mind. Morals, reservations, public image, and all that Suzuki held on to during his whole political life. All they ended up doing back then was standing in his way, and well, cer they certainly would now at a time of crisis when he had nothing left to lose. Left to lose. He felt disgraced and thoroughly offended by himself, as if he was supposed to know better than those degenerates in Tokyo, yet for once, he felt like he was slipping into their shoes even just a little. Breaking free from those unsavory thoughts, Suzuki picked up the pen with one trembling hand, still wet from cold sweat. If all it takes is one more red envelope, then one more ingot of gold, and one more bottle of sake to pull others over to the side, so be it. Till you book his guy's pitching it, Mashuhito. Of course, we're going to tell Sony, Morita, he gets his support. Alternative solutions. The Guangdong police force is overstretched, meant for upholding the law and dealing with smaller protests. The Chinese and the riots are too much for them to handle, naturally. We have also sent the camp by tide to deal with these riots, but even their brute efficiency cannot quell the delinquency of the rioters. It's time that we turn to a more unconventional source of enforcement. Our friends in the Yakuza are willing to use their own methods to deal with the rioters. In exchange for various perks, less restrictions on their operations, appointing Yakuza members into important bureaucratic positions, and so on, unfortunately. With their need for more enforcers to quell the riots, an offer we can't refuse. Uh, the call at night. The glowing ethereal moon hung gracefully over the cal caliginous night skies, its rays of light looming over the metropolis of Koshu, only being rivaled by the ray of fluorescent neon lights of the streets of the city that came to life at night. Within the rows of adjacent office, office blocks, a man broken in disgrace sat restlessly on a modest office chair, Matsuzawa Takuji of the Moribund Yasuda Bank. Matsuzawa poured himself another glass of imported sake and let it flow down his throat, something that had become a lot more commonplace recently. He glanced towards the framed picture of his wife and children sitting upon his desk across the room, overwhelmed with concern for their survival and well-being. They had to return to Japan. They no longer had a future here, though he doubted they'd fare better back on the home islands. <clears throat> the ticking of the clock on the wall drew Matsuzawa's attention. It was getting late, yet he had no desire to sleep, having forced himself into sleeping on a makeshift bed in his office to process the following of the fallout of the crisis. His contemplation was interrupted by a distinct... Uh, ringing, a priority call. I reluctantly picked up the phone. What do you want from me? A distinctive, a distinctive voice replied. A favor, and if you and your family don't want to remain under the shadows of men in Tokyo for the rest of your lives, I suggest you listen. <clears throat> Matsuzawa sat, sat silently, watching the silver rays of lunar light projecting a glimmer of hope for the citizens of Guangdong go on. Suzuki's Lego sees decreased by 19. <coughs> Holy sh... Nikes! Well, beginning of the 1963 product cycle. Well, every day is a battle for the corporate warriors and emperor scientists of Guangdong. One day in particular stands out amongst the rest in its singular importance. An army manager spread forth from Koshu's boardrooms bearing budgets, memorandums, and office offices, spaces, and a factory floors across Guangdong, heralding the start of the year's product cycle. Once again in 1963, for a company's Guangdong race to see who can memorize and win over the hearts and wallets of the world with their advancements in gadgetry and engineering. Whether through technical brilliance, unforgetting marketing, Unforgettable marketing or ruthless cost management, one company will either take the world by storm or crash ignominiously in a failure. As a company's fortunes go, so too does Guangdong's economy. Support Sony? Yep. A flurry of gray. Holy sh... Nikes. We have 12 votes. Uh. <coughs> uh. That's so bad. Oh my god. Hundreds of men, women, and children of suits among tatters left their flats and swore in Port Shorey on the one ensuing afternoon as a ferry uh, prepared to dock. A few police officers hissed and waved at the batons of the crowd mo while mostly uh, merely eyed each other in stunned silence. None dared to raise the arasakas for the radio line from the Koshu had fallen de dead weeks ago. 
The port has been a bustling place, even as it changed hands and abandoned its regal title of Victoria Harbor. Even now and then, a colorful entourage of ferries and freighters would glide haughtily past the derelict, low rise apartments by the riverside. The laborers huddling inside, watching in, in a brew of fear and awe. Such had been the sense of normalcy until it was too swept away by the raging storm. First, they noticed more and more of the water beasts, congesting the waterways. Then came the rustling noises of suitcases when wheels echoing tirelessly across Hong Kong's alleyways and boulevards. Rumors of fellow countrymen being discharged from factory posts swept through the neighborhood. By the time the Hino Maru shone its crimson light upon the windows and balconies, even the most dim witted locals had just grasped what horrors were waiting on them if they did not act. So, to port, surely they flocked. Improvised banners in hand and pent up rage and heart. Go back to the sea, he waved the crowd. Isn't this where you, the Japanese belong? Get out of our homes, screamed the crowd. Who are, who are we to sit and watch you intruders nibble away at our lives? The crowd didn't know or simply didn't care that the intruders were never a choice, but Guangdong was the only patch of dry soil left. As a monstrous tsunami drove them from the home islands, casting them adrift with nowhere to return to. And as, as the crowd chanted, jeered and drowned themselves in wretched fury, few bothered to meet the horrified stares of the hundreds of men, women, and children atop the ferry's deck. Suits among tatters. Got good profitability, low interest, and terrible quality, which I think is better than what we had earlier. So. With TV5303 for automobile usage, compact design. Here we go again. Um, so, push upon the for No. Marketing. Something like this. The Chinese do not have a lot of trucks or vehicles, I assume. Um, so, we go down here. So, to the Japanese market. Chinese support goes down. Japap Japanese support goes up. The Republic of China goes up. Um, honestly, they have more vehicles over here. I'm gonna do that one. All right, so I don't want any more corruption if we can possibly manage it. Um, we do want as much product interest as possible and quality. So that's why I say political power for this. Increase Japan's approval, which we might need. Mm. It's all for the good in the end. <coughs> I don't want to do this one because I don't want to decrease police uh, patrols. Increase the camp by tech control. I don't like that either one. Arr. Product interest, five percent. Um, yeah, we're gonna close that one. Decrease Chinese government support and Chokoi support too. Interest goes up. Corruption goes up. I don't want any more corruption either. I don't want to decrease Chinese government support though either. Interest, corruption. I don't mind decreasing Zhujin's government support. Uh, money though, we can do that one. That's not bad. And we need both on the side. Sacrifice R R and D. Point five. Five fifteen percent. That's pretty good though. Quality? That's fine too. Cut corners and research? No. As much as I want to. I'm not gonna do that. Um, this one's not bad either. Increase monthly speed? That's actually pretty good to do. But I don't want to spend the 25 political power right now. It's quality about 25, 25. Money wise, 5% is not bad. Chinese government support and interest. <sighs> Chokai. Actually, let's look at the Chokai real quick. Chokai. Chinese government support. Oh, look, we got even more police support here. Chinese, Chinese support. It's not a lot. It's actually the lowest group. Chokai, ooh, we could sacrifice Chokai probably for that for now. Where was it? Um, Koshu, we don't want Koshu. Chokai. Ah, we'll do that one too. In my face, is flashing signs. No, Ma, I don't get it. If, I, if you count everything being on fire and people running around and looting in plain sight as normal, I honestly don't know what to tell you anymore. Everything's gone to crap. Three vans and trucks are burning around my booth as I speak. There's been a jewelry store break-in on the street barely half an hour ago, but thankfully we got it under control early enough for me to sneak a call to you. I've had my share of hardships go through and last the lawbreakers to handle Ma, but those are no criminals, they're just people. Frantic, desperate people, and some of them would even charge those Kampai Thai thugs and give them a chance. Yeah, well, we're exhausted, all right, if it makes one difference in the rule. Length and sh shifts or not, we'd thank heavens if some straight glass bottle doesn't hit us in the head or 10 or 15 minutes in our job anyway. Ah, Sion. Did you tell you about him earlier, yes? He nearly boarded a huge brick just this morning, and he's been unusually silent ever since, when he wouldn't shrugged it off every other day. It chokes the life out of you. Everything going on in the cities makes you wonder if there's a tomorrow after all, at all. Ma, if I could take a break from doing dwindling wages, from the screams all around us, from having to chase down fellow countrymen every darn minute, and return to your side, I would, but the truth is, nothing wi nothing's within our control anymore. Whatever heck is breaking through out there across the seas, it's coming for all of us, whether uh, wherever we are. And I'm not sure if I can just ask for leave and have another hapless colleague bear my burden. Uh, looks like there is another case. I'm sorry, I'm, so I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry. Just, just sorry for not being there when you might need me the most. Take care. Click. Oh, boy. Seeking out, and you shall find. Bootlicker. It wasn't just a brick hurtling past his head that gave Hayashi Kozin a virtual concussion. A virtual concussion. It was also roars and jeers that followed. They kept rippling across his mind even hours after he's watched... 
Ah Kuang scuttled back from the phone booth, the red face and head lowered. Everything okay back there? Where was all Lam Hao Xiong could muster up? What was he would he reprimand a colleague and companion for sending his regards home anyway? The worst hasn't reached there yet, so thankfully they'll manage for another week or two. Ah uh, Kuang brightened up before composing himself again. I, I couldn't thank you enough for looking out for me. Ah uh, Xion, another black spot on my ledger, and they'll haul my penniless boot looking butt back to the countryside, and then Ma, Pa, me will all be done for. He slammed his eyelids shut as despair once again crept on his face. Good heavens, this just isn't going to end, is it? Well, I'm offered no reply, his gaze astray and his head still ringing from shock. Bootlicker, sure. True bootlickers would have exempted themselves from the pay cuts and double chips we could go, rather than helplessly patrol this burning wreckage of a street and worry about dinner every single day. With every time pay of insults and glowers thrown from every direction to boot, his mind wandered to his own family. If there's only surviving this hex skip, just as fine. So, uh, what's the emergency then? Ah, uh, Kwong's inquiry snapped Hayashi back to reality, and he slowly turned around and gestured towards an ownerless front storefront, where two bloody youngsters were attempting their way through the shattered glass. I call the others off, he heard himself mutter. It just isn't worth it, don't you think? And I feel something so wrong doing the right thing. Stop the presses. We have reached the worst case scenario. The tycoons have turned against us. They've walked out of our meeting. The fault will be immense. Even so, there's some means by which we can manage just how much damage this causes. The first and most important stop in the press. If word gets out of that the tycoons have turned against us, there's no hope of salvaging the situation. Thus, we must clamp down on journalism, especially those we cannot control, until we are sufficiently prepared to deal with the consequences. Dilemmas. Suzuki Taichi uh, was working late again, of course. Even at this hour, he could still hear the distant noise in the streets, still see the smoldering fires set by the riots and the protests that had erupted in Koshu. Uh, he flashed himself a mirthless grin as he turned back to the reports lining his desks. News from the streets, none of it good at all. Suzuki thumbed through the papers, complaints about some insufficient resources, analyses on escalating violence, and most worrying of all, a report from his police chief informing him that Guangdong's security forces would soon be unable to keep pace with the mounting violence. He was running out of options, the Guangdong was running out of options. He could try and stem the tide with what he had, but that was a recipe for disaster, on the other hand. Suzuki paused for a moment, uh, leading through the top files to find what he was looking for. He has still had some avenues available. This year's chief executive and the IJA made him no stranger to dealing with criminals, yet they had resources at their disposal. Resources he desperately needed. Both the naive or native triads in the expanding Yakuza had means to shore up Guangdong security forces, but their support would come with a hefty price, both in money and or other more insidious costs. The other option was to capitulate to Kiyotaka and ask the Kenpai Tai instead to step in. But he knew better than anyone that what that would entail. So Suzuki rubbed his temple. The option of simply trying to hold on with the police was looking more attractive by the minute. But what did they say about the definition of insanity again? Guan Dong's chief executive picked up the phone on his desk and pushed back down with San alone. He the Kenpai Tai. Oh, oh crap, what do we choose? Guan Dong's San alone. The riots are happening. If we do nothing, we will, we're gonna burn. He needed the Kenpai Tai, which I don't want. Expat support. Comprised 10%. They have a lot of support from these guys. Decent support from these guys. Uh, hmm. Yakuza? I don't want the Yakuza here either. I just don't want the Kenpai Tai here, though. It adds so much corruption. Yakuza have a lot. They have less corruption here, too. If we do this one, it's gonna burn. <coughs> we need help. Uh, triads, maybe? Maybe? It's probably a bad idea to do it, so. Terrible, low, paying visit. Oh, crap. It's rare for UK and his triads. He's not sure if he can call them friends even after years to venture outside of Guangzhou. Even rare to be anywhere that isn't in an urban area. With this chaos in the city, it seems abundantly clear that life is better in the countryside, if only momentarily. He hasn't been in the countryside in what feels like his entire life, though the man is keenly aware of how he grew up here. The trucks rise and fall to the pace of the road's potholes, and perhaps he'll take the city's infrastructure for granted. A thought laments. They've been here for a few hours, and UK would ideally be asleep by now, the only thing keeping him awake is occasional potholes. He doesn't have to wait any longer, though. Looking through the window, he sees buildings and perhaps, if he squints, some kind of border control on the distant mountain. There's a sign that spells out Lok Chong City, and after that, a smattering of cars. They stop all four of them to descend on the truck and open the trunk, taking boxes upon boxes of aid, especially marked with government seals. There's a large group of people gathered around the town square, seemingly awaiting the distribution of aid. UK notes a large pile of crates full of supplies, probably coming over from the border, he thinks. As he sets down the last of his group's delivery, there's a voice calling out his name. It sounds familiar, and then it dawns on him. This is his brother, rushing over. It's nothing short of a miracle. The entire family's here. He greets all of them, and they're thankful that he's come over to help. For the children, he gives them a little toy, something to satiate them for the time being. 
but there's nothing you can offer to satiate the other adults other than deft avoidance. Questions of, is this legal, and have you been up to anything? But his mother feels like jabs at him, even though they mean well. Even if they tell him that everything will be fine and that they appreciate the money that he sends back to them weekly. Thoughts plague his brain uh, plague his brain as he walks off to have a smoke to calm his nerves. It doesn't work. Do they know where his, his money goes? What he works for? What would mother say if she found out the money goes to buy guns, bombs for dissidents? That is blood in his hands. The question circles around him. Vultures eyeing their next meal. That's good to be home at least. Uh, we need more interest. Fair the mass market. Uh, new political power too. Let the camp buy tech test products. It's not bad. That's really good though. Cut corners, no. Jeffy's expat support. Force, force over time. A rebuttal. Allegations have been spreading so that we are failing to deal with the crisis, no doubt spread by our enemies and the tycoons. This is blatantly false to the point where it's almost ridiculous to suggest such. Even so, letting the spread unimpeded is dangerous for our efforts, so we must publish a rebuttal. And all the newspapers and official news channels will make our defense heard, and are not hurt to slip in some lies of our own. Caution. Oh, shit, Nikes. Force the issue. The Legislative Council, uh, uh, cabal of politicians, investors, and businessmen that make up the closest thing to a government here in Guangdong. The only purpose is to increase the benefits of Guangdong and the many companies that are invested in, in, in its industry. We still have to confront them, since they are our largest opponent to it, Guangdong, with us at the helm. We must demand that they stop interfering in our work. We must demand that they stop interfering in our work, of course, and to stop sabotaging our legislation. We demand their support in the regime. For the good of the three pearls. So, w w would it be best to do all these and then do this one? And when that one fires, we can do this one as fast as we can. We have no seats. A rock. 43 factories in Mac Macau facing imminent shutdown. Uh, estimated layoff at thousands. Excessive uh, RLSL restrictions responsible. We ran one headline. A ping of horror and nausea shot through Suzuki. High levels can't buy type personnel spied in legislative council. Suspected its connections with office of the chief executive. Ran another slander. Utter basis of slander. On and on the papers ran. An endless wall of text crashing down on Suzuki and what remained of his hope of controlling the narrative. Horrible. His mind raced, descending into a frantic spiral. How many newspapers, radio channels, and broadcasts have gone into other pockets already? How many are there left willing to speak for him? Unfolding before his very eyes is an outright media free for all, and already he was being outmaneuvered. Outmatched and assaulted on all sides by the media's pitch dark gun barrels he himself had so dexterously swayed and exploited in his favor. Now turned against him by the era loose of string pulling corporates. Suzuki could almost feel the color being drained from his face. As a nightmare of losing the majority in the upcoming council vote inched closer and closer to reality. The one thing that would spell certain doom for his entire career. Almost subconsciously, he grabbed hold of his pen once more, as he had done countless times ever since it all came crashing down. Marita, Masushita, Ubaka, Ibuka. Uh, who knows how many others? Any of them could be behind all this, and it's time they knew the bounds of the chief executive's magnanimity. So, maybe remind of their place? Should I, I think I feel like I should go back. Wait, oh, we left. Just to see how much we can. Oh, God, that actually slumped down. It's not good. Um, how much we can actually, like, do. I'm trying to get other, you know. Things done, like get him to be okay. Average, middling, not bad. <coughs> the final call twelve votes. Suzuki's mind went blank. It's all over. It's all over. He predicted Ibuka's cohort spitting on him without hesitation. He expected Masushita's fence sitters deserting him at the earliest opportunity. Heck, he even foreseen some of Morita's deputies ending up swaying to the other side. But absolutely nothing as egregious as this. Not a single one of Yusuda's men had voted to keep keeping Suzuki Taichi as chief executive. No, it should have been like this. What was Matsuzawa thinking? What happened to his integrity? His willingness to work together and his awareness that the two of them were in the same gosh darn boat. Unless Matsuzawa had found a new patron. A new messiah to guide him through the turbulent times with brighter promises than anything Suzuki could ever offer. That would certainly explain why Suzuki had been cast aside. Left to collect dust like some second-hand effing chew toy. He was no longer needed. He was alone, adrift in the darkness, and did generously backstab the one person he had bothered to count on. Suzuki slumped back in his chair, head in his palms, and under defeat and dejection. He didn't hear the overseer's formal revocation of his title. He'd be gone in a few days anyways. He didn't hear the chamber erupting around him once more, one booming voice over another, proclaiming with glee how best to cut him into pieces and mail him to Tokyo. And he certainly didn't see the hand placing on his table a small paper note, a souvenir of goodwill, a symbol of betrayal, and a letter of farewell. Nothing personal. To avoid the fate of that befell on Suzuki, future chief executives can use the corruption under the... Uh, Three evils, a decision category during ordinances to gather votes. They can also uh, use corruption to buy up seats in desperate situations. That's failed. You're still here. Uh, 
on the run. A ship's heaving was far worse. Yasukawa Yoshihiko, Yoshiko thought queasily. When the roll was limited to a dimly uh, lit cabin below decks, with the horizon bobbing in and out from a view of solitary portholes. Every pitch and roll of the Kaihin Maru, seeming towards Koshu, upended her innards in a sickening dance that only last, that lasted nearly a week. Even then, the discomfort of her voyage was nothing compared to the gut-wrenching dislocation of the, of the days after Yasuda had collapsed, <clears throat> taking the Yasukawa's assets and investments along with it. When her father, the Baron, could hardly look Yoshiko in the eye now, when he did, he saw the wild-eyed panic mania that possessed him that, that night he had dismissed the servants before ordering Yoshiko to suffer trunk with as yet many yen belts as she could find. They had left everything else, the porcelain wardrobe, the dead of the Fukuo estate, the deed to the estate, and for the banks and loan trucks to find. It would, he, it would, he had said, buy them time. Yoshiko leaned listlessly against the bulkhead, her mind tumbling, seeking reassurances that would never come. As sequestered as she had been from her father's business, the reality was obvious that they were ruined completely and utterly to such an extent that their relatives wanted nothing to do with them. Now she was fleeing Japan, clinging to her father's favorite hope that the Suzuki would help, with only a trunk full of yen and a useless literature degree to her name. She barely noticed the cabin door closing until Baron Yasukawa sat next to her. The odor of cigarette smoke overwhelming. Everything will be alright, he said, forcing himself to smile, with all without looking at his daughter's crestfallen face. Will it? The Titanic. Suzuki Taichi, lame duck of the chief executive. He gave himself a bitter smirk as he gazed through the office window one last time into the swirling mass of fluorescent lights littering the Koshu skyline. It had come to this. Gone was the gleaming, everlasting freighter of his dreams, and this place was now a slaughterhouse of, out of heck, with a shrieking flames ravaging his interior and disparate screams of darn Japanese, Zujin, and Chinese souls echoing with him. It didn't matter how many steel plates he had commissioned, how many chorus corrections he had undertaken, this fabled vessel of riches and promises had been alive from the start, just like the unsinkable ship of old. Suzuki Taichi, the man who failed Guangdong, was this to be his legacy, his epitaph, even when none of his disasters were above fall in the cru uh, jewel of southern China had been his direct doing? Was there nothing left safe from the bureaucrat's filthy clutches? Nothing spared from the darn nation to the deepest corners of Inferno along with the demons of Yasuda? Even if he were to proclaim his innocence over and over, the gardens of Yomi would laugh and jeer, retorting, retorting to his face, You have made enemies of too many. So behind the dimly lit desk he sat, wallowing in a sudden grief until a shrill ring interrupted his thoughts. On the other side of the line was the Kaya Okinori, muttering, Offerings of condolences and promises of a handsome position in Tokyo, where he was to triumph over the other contenders for Eno's empty throne. Suzuki listened in silence as an eerie feeling of serenity dawned upon him. He turned his head back to the now half-vacant chamber, and in a dust-filled corner lay his trusty suitcase. A companion in his years in the army in the house of Pierre's, and now in his last days on a burning freighter, a friend he thought he'd never have to turn to again, and so captain, the captain abandoned the ship. <coughs> well, Tozawa Takuji, the last remnants of the Yasuda Zaibatsu, keeps his watchful eye over Guangdong. Matsuzawa's caught rices, huh? There goes Suzuki. Oh boy. The Yasuda Christ has hit a small business across Guangdong like a speeding uh, bullet train, killing a lot and crippling many. Motors. Nintendo's no exception to the sudden and painful crisis, barely hanging on to thanks to the will of the loyal employees, but sheer will can only get you so far until you have to face the real world, and y Yamauchi Hiroshi was doing just that. Laid into his office. Laid at night in the office, Yamauchi was tirelessly sifting through countless piles of documents and financial records that assessed just how much bad the damage to Nintendo really was. Yamauchi was a stern man, but he, there he found himself on the verge of collapse from the sheer stress and intensity he and his company had to face. Fighting back tears, Yamauchi bitterly took off his glasses, throwing them onto the floor and slamming his desk. Uh, he, he rubbed his face and thought about all the commitments he had made to his employees, his families, and to his clients. He thought about the now exorbitant price of instant rice that he had been subsidizing off of rather than actual meals. He thought of the lack of progress Nintendo was making and just the sheer direness it was in. Then he thought of giving up, of leaving Guangdong and abandoning this ill-fated uh, Ill venture. He thought about going home and just being content with a meager life as a lawyer. Even though it was just a momentary thought, it made him angry. Why should he give up? Why should he go home? He had already gone this far and he had no intention of failing the commitments he had made. He got off his chair and retrieved his glasses from the floor as well as the papers that had been scattered from around the outbursts. He neatly arranged them all up on his desk and composed himself. Yamauchi inhaled, 9, 10, do, leave luck to heaven. He exhaled very quickly he was back to work, resolute that he would not give up so easily in the face of adversity. A new start once more. And Chief Executive Matsuzawa. Um, are we supposed to do this? This man with Yasuda's empire in Guangdong begins and surviving the company's leer at his corpse. I'm ready to play. I guess it's supposed to happen, huh? I don't know. Holy crap, tsunami. Cracking down organized crime. Weather the storm. The empty throne. Uh oh. Chung Kong. Hail Hitachi. Guang Dong in the black. Holy crap. Um, 
Matsuzawa Taku Takuji. The representative director of the Elfeda Yusuke Conglomerate's Gong Dong operations have been selected by the peers to serve as the chief executive following Suzuki Taichi's untimely return to Tokyo. With his patron gone and his company on the death's door, Matsuzawa has barely any capacity to pick up the task of administering a Gong Dong spiraling into economic freefall, and that's just how the tycoons want it. So let me know, is, that the, is this the best way to get, uh, um, Sony, I guess, into power? Oh, decreases you see this Lego seats given to Sony. Oh, so, oh maybe it is. Increases Lego seats by these guys. An accidental appointment. The haze of Suzuki's Tai Chi's department was chief executive. Although there's a great deal of work unfinished, with hardly any process for handing over the responsibilities involved, the demands of the new chief executive's position present uh, a steep learning curve, and although Matsuzawa was closer to Suzuki than anyone else of Guangdong's tycoons, rumors have already started, perhaps from among the tycoons themselves, that he is in it for the job. That's some time down the line, a more permanent chief executive should preside along over Guangdong's affairs, but if you enjoyed the video, leave, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I'll see you tomorrow. As we'll continue to do the best we possibly can while everything is uh, falling apart. Thanks for watching. Have a great, 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 great rest of your day.